The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. So about two-thirds of my talk today is going to be kind of slides, and then the last third we're going to do a demo, and we're going to get a little more interactive then, so you guys can ask me to kind of poke around in the terminal and show, show things off. Um, <clears throat> my name is Elijah Wright. I'm a cloud ops engineer at Joint. How many of you guys have heard of us before? Yeah, like all oh, those guys. <laughs> we, um, we've been around a while. We're about a seven-year-old company. We are a public cloud hosting service provider. Um, the difference between us and most of the other things out there is that we're actually a Solaris shop top to bottom. So we mostly don't have Linux infrastructure. We sell Linux VMs, but that's not really what we're about. Um, <clears throat> some things about me, I'm an ops guy. I've been a sysadmin for 20 something years. Um, my beard is getting a little gray now, nowadays. Um, I like automation. I use Chef a lot. I've used Puppet in previous jobs. Um, we do a lot of things in Git, a lot of triggered things in Git that are interesting to us. And as we grow, more and more of our decisions have to be data driven. So I'm really into that these days. Um, I've been an Ubuntu user forever, Debian user longer. Um, my first distro was SLS back in the day. So 1993, 1994. Um, but I use a Mac too, whatever. Um, big problems that I face, mostly the operations problems. A lot of the interesting performance problems or multi tenancy problems where you have the same customers on a machine together competing for the same resources. So you'll get you know, peaks and spikes where they stack up and get rotten performance. Um, like I said, I've, I've been a Linux user for a long time. This is kind of home, um, just as much as the Solaris crew or OS 10 deployments are. <coughs> okay, so join it. Some people have heard of join it. We're growing pretty well right now. Um, <coughs> We have a public cloud, but then we have a software operation behind that that is pretty significant. We have a data center product. We have a bunch of the key D-Trace authors in-house. Um, we have a port of KVM where we took the, the source of KVM running on Linux and we grafted it onto the Solaris API instead. That's a really cool project, um, very nice. Um, SmartOS, which is the under, underpinnings of what we're gonna talk about today. Um, the Node.js core developers work in the bullpen with our engineers. They're all right there together. There are a lot of neat things going on. Um, differentiator for SmartOS and for all of the other Illumos ports as compared to a Linux shop is Dtrace. So we have introspection built in everywhere. It's actually built into the innards of the kernel. So you can insert the kernel itself in real time and turn those, those probes on and off and see what's going on. If you don't know that you trace, it's something you're gonna to wanna to go read about later. It's really cool. <clears throat> so SmartOS is a give back project. Um, we use it in house, it benefits us, but it benefits everybody else too, for us to just turn around and say, you know, here's something that you can use, it's different. We're not sure where the future is going, try it out. Okay, so <clears throat> how, many, how many of you are Sun fans from way back? You like Sun? Did you like it when Oracle bought Sun? <laughs> yeah, nobody else did. <laughs> so when Oracle bought Sun, there was an exodus of engineers. And Oracle turned around and took the source code to open Solaris and decided they would just stop pushing it out into the open. So there's, there's a build, it was the last build, Oracle let flow out. A bunch of people in the community took that last bill, which almost all of it was open source. 
the inter internationalization bits and the SSL bits were not completely open. And in a matter of a few weeks, they were able to take the source, turn around and replace all those bits, and have a working, buildable, runnable system again. That's a Lumos, a Lumos project. So a lot of a lot of different people have got builds of Lumos right now. Um, SmartOS is a big one. The other big one is OmniCI, which is run by or OmniOS, which is from OmniCI, which is run by Theo Schlossnagel. If you've read the book about scalable internet architectures, that's Theo. That's his company. Awesome stuff going on. Open Indiana, you might have heard of. That's another project. Also, that's a desktop kind of distribution of Illumos. Also very good. So we're trying to take code that's been around a while and take the solid engineering that's been done and turn it into something that's really attractive and usable. If you're like me and you're a little, a little older <laughs> and you used Solaris 2.5 or Solaris 2.6, it's not really impressive from the usability standpoint. It's kind of a pain in the ass sometimes. Oops. Um, so we've got, we've got Snuggle. And I have a, a bear there. I did not use the Snuggle fabric softener bear because I'm sure he's copyrighted all over the place. But he's kind of steampunked out, so he's a little bit technical. So what we're going to talk about in the talk today is we're going to talk about some of the technical bits under SMGL or Snuggle and about zone brands in general because they're interesting. This is an interesting conceptual thing. We're going to talk about what's good about it. We're going to talk about what's kind of not so good about it. And we're going to talk about you know, what, what do you guys think that you could do with something like this? Because it's a stable, usable thing. OK. <clears throat> so I have history slides. I have a time lord, time machine down the bottom there. Um, SmartOS is a distro built on the Lumos. That's a work of Open Solaris that we talked about a minute ago. I mean, this, is, this is code from some of it back to the, the early 1980s. And it's, it's got a consistent history that's gone on. But what happens when you do that is you get multiple copies of some utilities in there. So you'll have four or five copies of REST on the system, or AUK. Or you'll have AUK and NAUK and GNU AUK. Which one do you use? Well, if you're not an AUK wizard, you probably don't know. <clears throat> so it can be very unfamiliar. If you became a system administrator, Anywhere from, next, let's say 1995 on, you've probably touched a lot of Linux machines. And that's probably been most of what you've had access to at home. Or in the workplace even. Because enterprise gear that runs Solaris has been kind of expensive. So what we, what we distribute for SmartOS is a downloadable image you put on a USB stick or an ISO or boot it straight into VMware or VirtualBox or whatever you choose. And you boot up a host that's basically a management host that contains what we call zones. And zones are OS container personalities, basically. So there are a lot of conceptual varieties of these that people have had. You know, there's, there's virtualization. This is not virtualization. Not in the sense that I have a hypervisor and all the stuff that runs on it. This is I have an OS, it boots on the metal, and then I'm carving pieces of it off and using them like they're independent systems. So um, if you've written system code before with port commands and things in it, you know kind of how those resources trickle down when you fork off a new process. Truth being a classic example, um, I know the Debian project uses Truth extensively for building different flavors, you know, stable, unstable, testing. Those are basically just in truth builders. Uh, FreeBSD has jails. Jails are getting more and more awesome. They're more like gnomes than anything else. Um, you have Linux container patches for the kernel. I'm not up to speed on what's happening there at all. Um, this thing came out called docker.io a few weeks ago that everybody was really excited about, and I guess they still are. Um, basically, makes a Linux kernel much more like Solaris with those. It's a good thing. It's great technology, great stuff. So, a zone is 
the portion of the system that you can assign capacity caps and limits to, how much swap can I use, how much physical memory can I use, how much disk quota can I have, um, how many processes can I, can I spawn at once. You know, there, there are good reasons to limit all those things so that somebody doesn't just consume everything. Um, there are several different ways historically that these have been done. Um, the, the big categories are to have shared nothing, where you just install another copy of Solaris inside of a zone file system and boot the whole thing up. So it has its own copy of init, its own copy of all the services, independent IP stack, everything. Um, you can have a hybrid where most of the thing is independent, but the larger components of the system, like your user file system tree, where all the system's commands and things are, can just be inherited from the management zone. So you save a lot of disk space that way, and you've got less physical pieces on the disk. It's cool. Um, there are other things that people do where they share just some resources, like a particular network device, they just pass it through and let that zone take it over. Maybe a PCI card, or USB stick, something like that. Um, another twist there is that each of these zones that you set up, regardless of how you do them, you can either give them a dedicated network stack, or they can share that, that network stack in the management zone. The, the big change there is where the firewalling actually has to happen. If it's shared network, then the management zone can do everything. If you give them their own network, then they can do things like run load balancers or do hot failover, but you have to firewall it inside the zone then. Okay, so <clears throat> a little more history before we talk about Snuggle. I'm sorry that this takes so long to tease out, but if I don't give you the history lesson, and if you don't already know what the things are, then Snuggle is like, how's this work? It would be very confusing. So there are a variety of types listed up here. There's a traditional type and there's a syscall translating type. Um, the ones up, up at the top, the interesting ones, the iPackage zone that's not iPackage like you run on a wireless router, that's uh, the Solaris IPS packaging system. Uh, cluster was the Solaris cluster. Label is for trusted Solaris 10. So if you want to have military grade kind of labeled processes and things, that was where you were. Um, Joint is our in-house label. Um, when Sun slash Oracle released Solaris 11, they killed support for shared root zones. So we actually had to put it back into the code. I mean, they, they like hack and slash it out, it was gone. So that's where we got a joint brand from. KVM is our virtualization hypervisor port. Um, it's basically a zone like any other zone, but it has a copy of QEMU running inside of it. That's what that is. Uh, SNGL is the Snuggle project experiment. The second type, so it's called translating. This is all um, emulation to get previous products to kind of cooperate and play along. So if you remember, um, SunOS had a thing called Wabi that was a Windows ADI executing product. Basically a line, but on Solaris, and there were accelerator cards for it and all this other stuff. Um, I'll point out the LX brand, that actually was Linux running inside a Solaris node just by, by gluing the, the binary interfaces together and passing things back and forth. That was Red Hat Enterprise 3, so it's been a while, like seven or eight years now. Um, okay, so SNGL, that's Snuggle. That's kind of what we want to talk about. Let's see, I talked about this already, didn't I? Yeah. So for, for sparse root, I've listed here things that you might do. Um, you know, you're, you're going to have to have var for your logs and etsy for some config. You know, what's my host name? That sort of thing stored there. But you can make a sparse root zone pretty small. 20 megs, something like that, and have a running system still. So what's cool about this? 
Well, what's cool is that if you've got all these utilities that you're inheriting from your management zone, the upgrade's pretty much free. You reboot the whole box to update its platform, and all these things that are getting inherited in your zones magically update because it's the same binaries. It's not, it's not anything special. <coughs> Yeah, the beneficial thing here, when your user zones are that light, then if you're telling a customer, oh, here's 10 gigs of disk quota, you're really giving them most of the 10 gig and not carving a gig off for the OS or trying to do the machinations of how do I build this out? You know, they have to have this 300 megs of data to run the system, but they shouldn't have to pay for that. It's complicated. So, sparse route, pretty cool. <clears throat> oh, the other, the other thing to remember, we're still talking about just a zone. It's just a personality, it's just the kernel playing games with the process table and a few other things. There's no virtualization tax, you get native performance on all the hardware still. Um, if you've got a 10 gig Ethernet card, you're going to be able to get whatever the hardware can actually push around in your machine. Um, if you've not done a lot of virtualization work, then you might not be aware, but virtualized network speed not good, not good. Because all that, all that hardware that's on your network card is suddenly, all those timers are being kept up by this, your main CPU then. And a lot of those things, they're not multi-threaded. The emulation of them is not. So it, it can get into some brutality. Okay, so what was, what was wrong with Sparks Root? Um, I've been around a while, I've been through a few product generations of this stuff now. User was almost always read-only. That's not, that's not where user, end users were expected to install things by the original architects in this. Um, it sounds okay, and kind of like, well, okay, it's just user, so what? Maybe I go up into my management zone and install it there, and then it just pops up everywhere. That's fine until you have two customers that want different things in the zones that are on the same hardware, and then you're like, what I do with these. This is not going to work out. So, in products that we've had at Joint, um, and actually in Open Solaris in general, people wind up just putting all their stuff in off local. I mean, this is like an old school thing. If it's locally site installed software, just put it in off. You know, it'll be okay. It's not that weird, but if you've never seen it before, you're like, what? Why are you using ops? Nobody does that. No, people do that. Um, there's also things like library proliferation. Because I'm bringing in all of user, I'm going to get user UCB, user bin, user CCS, all these other things that have commands in them that you don't even think are there. Um, there's stuff all over the place. So, <laughs> we, we made some efforts to fix this. And I've just pasted it in part of my talk proposal here so you get kind of the thesis statement of what Snuggle is about. It's so that we have a zone brand that has a user land that the end user can actually update in the way that they want to do it, not the way that we think they should do it. Um, it's still a Lumos. It still has a Solaris ABI. But all the Solaris traditional bits are kind of pushed off to the side where you don't have to look at them if you don't want to. And there's our path. So instead of those bits living in user and lib, they're basically remounted under slash system. And we've gone through and fixed the few bugs that prevented that from happening. So places where there were path names hard-coded into the platform itself, people have gone in and fixed that now. It turned out to only be, if I remember what one of the, the engineers told me, it was something like four bugs in all of Solaris that kept that from happening. That's pretty cool. That's a cool small number. Um, your system binaries that you install are all going to go in user bin the way you expect. Um, when you boot a snuggle zone for the first time, and I'm going to show you one in a minute, the user bin has a bunch of symbols in it to things that you might find useful. 
there actually assimilates into the traditional Illumos Solaris derived copies. But when you install something that conflicts, it nukes assembly and you get the thing you asked for instead. You get GNU with LS variant, GNU lock, um, the normal stuff. Awk is always an interesting one for me because I keep trying to do things with Awk and I discover, oh, this example only works in GNU Awk. I guess I'll use GNU Awk. Okay, so why, why would I want this? I told you a few things. Um, it's a comfort thing. People want to be comfortable with the tool set that they're using. They may get told, we're going to host this on Joint because they have D-Trace and we want to use it. Or we're going to host it on Joint because they're partnered with the Node guys. The Node guys are helping us. Let's go do it over here so they'll continue to, to be handy to us. There's also a, a glide path involved in this where maybe you've used something else and you're trying to get comfortable, you're trying to figure out where to go. What am I supposed to do here? Um, maybe you want to do some D-Trace self-study, something like that. And you need something to do it on that doesn't just make you crazy. Um, I was talking to, to Jesse Trucks last night, who's a guy that I bet you probably have seen walking around here. And uh, I was talking with him about the generations of systems that come through. Um, my peers, I guess, all like Perl. To, to me, Ruby is this thing that came from Japan 15 years ago, and I, I don't really get it. It doesn't all compute for me yet. And Node.js, I still haven't caught up either. It's, I want to, it's cool. It does fascinating things. I just haven't caught up yet. And, that, and those preferences that people have, are totally okay. It's, it's beneficial, it's good. I don't write code in COBOL. I don't write code in Fortran anymore. <laughs> Fortran is cool if you're going to engineering school. It's, it's awesome. <clears throat> so, in Snuggle, here's kind of the default thing. It's using package source for packages. Um, we have two package source developers in-house. And this is what they do. So making it work with the work that they're already doing, this is a big deal to us. It's, it's important. Package source is a BSD thing. Um, it came from, I think, NetBSD originally. And so it's a, it's a cousin to the FreeBSD ports trees and Mac ports and some other things like that. Um, I think Brew is a more distant cousin. I've been using Homebrew lately. Um, Package source, you write package definitions, it knows where to get the so source code from, it knows what the interdependencies are, it goes, it downloads all of it, it builds it for you, it installs packages. You can build binary packages with it, whatever. It's just like RPM or app get, it's just a little different. I guess I should say, just like dpackage. I don't want to call the whole package just an app get, it's kind of silly. So, <clears throat> anyway, package source, 2,000 plus packages in the tree that Join it itself is supporting. Package source as a whole, more like 20,000 packages, I think. Um, common stuff just works. You know, if you need to install Apache and PHP, how much easier can it get? Package in, install Apache. You're finished. <clears throat> There's a great blog post here. I put the URL in here specifically because I think that post is so valuable. Um, Jonathan Perkins is one of our package source developers who has been working on package source since long before he was for us. He was at the BBC and doing this stuff with them. Um, he also built community package kits you know, for other Solaris's and all kinds of stuff. He's a great guy. Okay, Nito, how do I get this thing? If you go to smartos.org, you can download the VM image. Um, if you need something free to run it in, go get VirtualBox or whatever, whatever floats your boat. Um, I don't think it'll run in VMware View. Is that the thing they had that was free? Okay. <laughs> so there are instructions at that URL on the last slide to help you get a snuggle room booted up and running. Um, then you're off to the races. You can start 
change the config, install the packages, building, test dev stuff on your laptop, <coughs> whatever you want to do. So the other, the other thing that I wanted to do before we kind of go into a little more interactive mode is what would you guys do with this? I mean, we haven't looked at it yet, but from my point of view, one of the things I always had trouble with was writing portable code that was actually portable. Because I'd sit down with a Linux machine, read the man pages, follow the examples, and then I'd go try to build it on a FreeBSD box. And I'm like, damn it, it doesn't work. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work. I don't understand. And then I go read the spec that's a little more detailed, and I'm like, oh, that only works over here. Um, Lots of things out there will build on Linux machines that won't build on other things. And it's usually not because of the OS. It's usually the code makes assumptions that are not always true. So this is a community service thing that everybody can do. If your code doesn't build on Snuggle or on Lumos, tell somebody. Ask for help. Some, somebody will help you. Um, this is not, it's not typically a big thing. and. We have a bunch of people on IRC who are willing to help you if you need help porting your code and making it run on this platform. So <clears throat> comfort level stuff, um, if you're used to community utilities and you want to use it for that, just to have an alternate, awesome. What, what, else, what else would you guys do with what's being described? Want to think about it? Want to take a tour? copies of different things in UCB, ECCS. Oops. Oh, maybe I need this. Okay. Spin has a bunch of stuff in it. Um, unfamiliar looking things like the N68K binary. It returns true if you run it on N68K box. So this 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 command is a Sun OS-ism from the early, early 90s. There are a bunch of other weird ones littered in here, too. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's old school BSD code underneath here. Regardless of Solaris having been the System 5 thing, there's still BSD legacy stuff under the covers here. I have to break myself into the habit. Um, zone ADM is the old school way to show you what zones there are. Uh, VM ADM is the new school smart OS way. So VM admin list, and what we got here, we have UUIDs here. These are actually the, um, more or less the host names of the zones that I made. Um, they're UUIDs because you don't want to be dealing with that very much. Over here at the end, I've got aliases here. I have a running snuggle zone, this first one. And then I have two failed provisions from earlier that I don't know why they failed. Um, so we're going to Z log in to the snuggle zone here. Um, Z log in, if you're familiar with Zen, is like type of XM login at the console. It takes you from the management zone in. <clears throat> so you get what looks like the response you get from SSH. It basically is very similar. So you can see this is where I'm going to log in if I got spawned. 
And those that are isolated off in the place we expected with um, system prepended in the front. Let's go look at the Okay, there's some stuff here. So this is the default environment that the guys have put in here into this build. You see there's a <laughs> knock in the car users, XML2 stuff. Um, there is some yellow pages stuff down here if you were running this in your local environment. That's terribly, terribly old school. But you can see the light blue color. Most of these are actually simulates off in the system somewhere. Um, there are things that you might expect to have in your path if you weren't really sure what kind of zones, whether you were logging into. And they're just there as a convenience thing. Okay, let's look at some of these binaries. We'll run LDD on OTT. So LDD, you probably know, is the uh, thing that shows you the, the, the link structure of what's being used by your binary. I think the OTT command, just out of air, it didn't actually turn out to be a very good example. Because it's just like this stuff in lib. That's, that's your Solaris lib sheet and your math library there. OK, that's a little better. So we do the same thing with GNU off, and we get an interesting mix of things. There are things here that are in user lib. So internationalization support actually came from package source packages that were pre-installed. Uh, libumem, which is a memory allocator, that's actually off in the system. Socket library is off in the system. That's that's hardcore OS stuff. The um, the GCC runtime down at the bottom, the GCC one is in user, and this is this is one of the things that was actually a required change to make this work um, that had to come in with the packages because if it had been off in the system directory, the approach the guys took to build this um, zone brand would not have worked so well. You would have wanted to put binaries that had broken links all the time. Um, trying to run the stack on an updated platform where we reboot the, the host later it might not have gone so well, it might have just broken everything. So this probably all looks pretty familiar. Um, like any Linux machine you sit down at, it has a resolver, <coughs> it has a name server switch prompt file. Um, there's a profile here, there's an Etsy shadow, there's an Etsy password. This is all very generic generic and mixed stuff. But it's also pretty cool. Let's poke around the system in a minute. Actually, let's do this. Okay, so if you remember what I was showing you a minute ago from the global zone, it's the same file. And you can see in DS down here, over at the side, uh, slash system slash user. Well, it doesn't help you. It says slash system slash user in both places. But let's experiment. Oh, here we go. So this is the config for that zone. And down here, somewhere, oh, maybe it's not in here, maybe it's actually in the brain code. Okay, so I was going to show you how some of those loopback maps work, but I've been misled. They're not actually defined here. They're in the zone brain. So they're in the kernel code that handles that zone. Oops. I think there's a definition file somewhere on the system we could probably go hunting for, but it doesn't seem quite worth the, the digging right now. Let's 
explicit was actually pre-installed. <clears throat> so a lot of these things are minor things that are needed mostly to make the system work. But Jonathan was going through in this um, package the, the pre-salt kit that you get with Snowball. And he's put a bunch of the community utilities in already so people have them. One of the one of the really difficult things for people has always been um, how do I transition between platforms? I'm used to this one. Now I have this other one. Now I have a Mac 2. Now I have another platform that's different. Now I have maybe a Debian hat box and a Red Hat box that don't work the same. And it's always the same lump of getting to terms with the environment and taking a couple weeks of being frustrated and looking around for the commands before you get it running. But hopefully this helps. This is one of those things where the people in the community asked for something like this because they were dissatisfied with what they had before. And so our engineering folks actually went and built it for them and said, here, try this instead. Um, I'm out of slides. We've got some time left. What are you guys going to do? Are there, are there things you're curious about or questions that you have about, about why we would do this? Everybody's sleeping. That's what happens after lunch. And it's hot in here, too. Nothing? OK. Thanks for coming, guys. We will stop our tape and shoot the breeze. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones it extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. 
again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a uh, thing like that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, this um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. 
Plastec management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects. And there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked.